thanks to all of you. There are a lot of questions here. I don't know that I'll be able to get through them all, but I will do my best. Um, first question is about uh, whether there's been any research using so-called anti-inflammatory diets in chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, none that I'm aware of, um, but I think that it's a reasonable idea and a reasonable thing for people to try. And I'd, be, I'd like to hear your experience with it, after, if any of you do try it. The, uh, there certainly is evidence of an ongoing inflammation in chronic fatigue syndrome, in, in parts, at least, of the immune system involved in inflammation. <laughs> That's more cookies than I can. <laughs> Don't tell my wife. Um, so, so I think it's a reasonable reasonable thing to do. Um, do you recommend annual flu shots? This is a complicated question. Um, I think, it's never been studied, I think that following immunizations of any type, the flu shot is the most common, that pe people with CFS not infrequently have a day or two when they feel worse. That what is the immunization doing after all? It's a new challenge to the immune system, an immune system that's already in a state of activation. So, uh, but I have never seen any serious problems with flu shots in CFS patients. And flu, while we talk about it sort of like, the, like it's the common cold, in fact, the true flu caused by influenza virus can be a very serious, even a life-threatening condition. There are something between 5,000 and 40,000 people who die every year in the United States f from flu. So my advice to all my patients uh, and advice that I take myself is to get a flu shot each year. Have I noted any connection between a prior case of mono followed by CFS? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, that is, some patients with CFS, including quite a number that I've seen, became ill at the time they first developed mononucleosis. And in almost all cases, uh, that mononucleosis was caused by a new infection with Epstein-Barr virus. And the study that I talked about from Australia looked at every single person in that community in rural Australia that had a new infection with Epstein-Barr virus. Most of those people got mono from the virus and 10% of them, 11%, went on to develop CFS. So it is one type of post-infectious chronic fatigue syndrome comes from mono. Make that a little more complicated. While Epstein-Barr virus is the cause of most cases of mono, there are several other infectious agents that can produce a, an illness that's very much like mono, including human herpes virus 6. But typically mono is caused by Epstein-Barr, and some of those people can, one I just saw for the first time uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, never have recovered fully after the mononucleosis that in her case she got 40 years ago. The CDC case definition uh, is almost 20 years old. Will there be any attempt to upgrade it? Well, what the CDC did about uh, eight years ago is talk not about a new case definition, but and I was strongly in support of this, but with better information about how to collect information that allows a doctor to apply the case definition. Because the symptoms that constitute the syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, how you ask about those symptoms and how you judge whether they're severe enough to qualify for CFS, all of that is left very fuzzy by the current case definition. So that improvement has been made. There also, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, are other case definitions, including one developed with a 
group of Canadian and U.S. investigators uh, several years ago. Uh, so there are alternative case definitions. Um, my own feeling is the energy that and time and effort that needs to be spent studying CFS would be best spent understanding the biology of it because that's where ultimately we're going to define this illness not by a group of symptoms but by biological measurements and we need to get those measurements. What about amplogen as a treatment? Amplogen is an experimental drug um, that the theory behind it is that it is a string of, of nucleic acids, RNA uh, acids, that were built to look sort of like a virus, to trigger the immune system to fight an infection even though the amplogen is not actually an infectious agent. It just sort of looks like one to the immune system. Um, amplogen has been studied, to my memory, in two uh, randomized trials and with some improvements shown it, comparing the amplogen group to the placebo group. But there are, uh, st those were small studies. They didn't really address the question of how long the treatment would be effective and uh, in any event the treatment is not uh, available except as part of experimental trials and I don't know in the United States of any new trials that are underway right now. So it's up to the company to decide if it's going to do more studies. They have not convinced the Food and Drug Administration from the available studies they've done that the drug should be approved for use for chronic fatigue syndrome. Has neurofeedback been used to treat cognitive deficits in chronic fatigue syndrome? No, not to my knowledge, um, but because it has had good effects in a number of other illnesses, I think it would be a good idea uh, for someone who knows how to use that therapy to conduct the study. This is an interesting question. Have there been studies of the impact of weather and changes in the weather on CFS symptoms? Uh, there, not to my knowledge, uh, are, have been any studies. There have been studies of changes of the weather in other illnesses, particularly rheumatologic illnesses, characterized like CFS by a lot of body pain. Uh, and those studies, as I've read them, and it's been years since I read any, um, sort of are, come to mixed results. Having said that, I have many patients with CFS in my practice who absolutely, no, they can tell you when a front, a weather front is moving in, and they can tell you they're going to be feeling worse within the next 24 hours. Uh, and I. You know, any study that's ever done on any subject gives you a result for the average patient in that study. And if it doesn't find any effect in the average patient, that does not mean there is no effect in some patients. So I, I'm impressed by the patients who tell me uh, new, new weather fronts coming in. Uh, first of all, I can predict that they're coming. And secondly, I know I'm going to be feeling worse. And I, I respect that. I hear it not only from CFS patients, but patients with lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, a number of rheumatologic diseases. But not everybody. Re question about oxidative stress. What consideration has been given that it is wholly or partially caused by external environmental factors, specifically chemicals? Well, it, it may very well, in fact, I think it almost always is triggered by external environmental factors, but those external environmental factors can only affect the body by entering the body. What are those factors? They could be infectious agents. We know that most infectious agents, as the body responds to them, create oxidative stress. 
And we know that that's true of certain toxins that get into the body as well. So yes, it could be that environmental chemicals, when they enter the body, in genetically vulnerable people could be triggers for CFS. But that's far from proven. Is fibromyalgia syndrome, or FMS as some people call it, the same as CFS? It is very similar in the symptoms that it causes. We, uh, along with Dr. Don Goldenberg at Newton Wellesley Hospital, 20 years ago, did a study showing that, did several studies showing that patients with chronic fatigue syndrome very often also meet the criteria for fibromyalgia and vice versa. Those with fibromyalgia, when you ask them the questions about chronic fatigue syndrome, meet the criteria very often for chronic fatigue syndrome. I would have said 20 years ago, they're basically the same illness, just going under different names. Uh, today I'm not so sure, because there are a number of studies of objective biological testing that find differences between fibromyalgia patients and chronic fatigue syndrome. So they may not be the same exact illness, but they certainly share many of the same symptoms. And in fibromyalgia, there have been multiple randomized trials that show that the low-dose tricyclics that I told you seem helpful anecdotally in chronic fatigue syndrome. In fibromyalgia, it's not anecdotal. There are good randomized trials that show that these agents help fibromyalgia patients. That's why I and other doctors began to use them in chronic fatigue syndrome. So there are a lot of overlaps between the two illnesses, whether they're really the same, uh, that I don't know. Uh, question, is it possible to get a copy of the presentation? I believe that the association is going to post a video on the web, and so that kind of a copy you can get. But I didn't, I don't have a, I didn't speak from a written manuscript, so I've got nothing to share. And the slides will be posted on the website as well. Um, the question is with the rituximab and valgancyclovir treatments that I talked about, while the differences were statistically significant, were they really uh, a very, was, were they clearly clinically significant? And the impression from both studies is that they were clearly clinically significant, that people were functioning clearly better. Uh, that was more persuasive with rituximab than valgancyclovir. But as I said, the, the studies were both very small, and drawing any firm conclusions from such small studies that lasted a relatively short period of time is hazardous. So yeah, I th when I called them encouraging, I meant that the improvements seen were not marginal, but seemed to be significant to the patients who improved. Why are there so few randomized controlled trials or large studies um, to, um, to make mainstream medicine take us seriously, one person asks. Um, fair question. I think the answer is, um, randomized controlled trials and large studies of any type, but particularly large randomized controlled trials, are extremely costly. And uh, who's going to pay for those studies? It's either going to be the government, which right now is dealing with a medical research budget that has been cut 5% by the sequester, where one out of 10 scientists' research is getting funded. Uh, and finding money for very large, expensive clinical trials for any disease in that environment is, uh, is very difficult. Drug companies are the other source of support for uh, randomized controlled trials, but they have to have a drug that is novel, that they have a patent on, uh, and that if it works, they and they alone will be able to use for treatment of a particular illness during the life of the patent. 
Uh, and right now there are relatively few instances of that. Uh, so so it's, the answer is because really, really good studies require a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort um, in a world where at least the world of biomedical research, in my opinion, uh, we as a society are not spending nearly enough money on those, that kind of activity given the opportunities there are out there from advances in, in biological technology. We're squandering an opportunity to help millions of people by not funding adequate research. It's a question as to whether with all of these markers that I've talked about that distinguish patients with CFS as a group from healthy individuals and in many instances from depressed individuals, some instances from other fatiguing illnesses like multiple sclerosis and lupus. Um, with all of these different markers, is it possible that patients with CFS actually fall into different subgroups? Uh, and the different subgroups may be defined by, in part, different markers. I think it's not only possible, it's probable. Uh, and there are several studies that, in fact, have done that, have, have put forward candidate subgroups of CFS. Uh, and, but, but it's very preliminary work. And the reason to do that is if those subgroups respond to different treatments. And that's why with any disease, you want to try to find subgroups that tell the doctor and the patient, it's definitely worth trying this treatment, don't waste your time with this treatment, because in your subgroup, that's not going to work. So that's why we look for subgroups. My bet is they're there, that they will prove to be very important ultimately in directing treatment, but it's early in the game. Do you or a loved one suffer from CFS? Uh, no, uh, but, but I have enough friends and patients who were previously healthy who became ill with chronic fatigue syndrome for me to take notice of it uh, 25, 30 years ago. If there were unlimited research dollars, where should they go right away? And thank, thanks for anyone who's going to provide them. <laughs> um, I, I think I've said it implicitly in this talk. I think following up the areas that w where we already know the, there is action. I, I, I think the <laughs> action in this illness is in the brain. Uh, it's in the brain because the illness is defined by symptoms and it is the brain and only the brain that perceives symptoms. And I think it is most likely that those symptoms occur because of biological processes that are underway in the brain. Possibly infection and the immune response to infection at the top of my list uh, and, and other possibilities. Someone asked me, um, does head trauma ever lead to CFS? And I think the answer to that is, yes, it does. Uh, there are a number of patients who have been referred to me from rehab facilities with major concussions uh, and long-term cognitive problems following head trauma who had no infectious illness at the start of their illness. Uh, they, their CFS, and they fully meet the criteria, their CFS began, as far as they could tell, with major head trauma. Uh, why is that? I speculate that that trauma provoked the same biochemical, neurochemical process in the brain that infection also can, and that's why the same combination of symptoms is present. That's a very loose answer that can only be addressed by a lot more precise hypotheses in research. <laughs>
Have I seen an elevated risk of any particular cancers in CFS, uh, especially those with ongoing viral activation? Um, if there is an elevated risk, it is very small. Uh, there is a study conducted by the National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, that looked at the communities in Northern California and Northern Nevada that appear to have been affected by an outbreak of CFS uh, that occurred in the mid-1980s in that part of the country. The study published by the NIH, by the National Cancer Institute, found higher rates of lymphoma and of brain cancers, um, glioblastoma multiforme, a particular kind of brain cancer, in those geographic areas for a period of several years after the epidemic that also was associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. That, to me, of, among a handful of papers on cancer in CFS, is the only really provocative paper that says, in a, what may have been a unique instance of a particular epidemic of some infectious agent in a particular geographic area, that in that case, whatever made people sick with CFS was capable also of provoking a very small increased risk of two particular cancers. Beyond that, I don't think there's uh, any serious evidence linking CFS to cancer. Can I please comment on stress as a trigger? Yeah, let me, let me do that. Um, but, but let me begin by talking about what do I mean by stress? Um, because I think as the word stress is used casually, even by doctors, um, the idea is that it's a characterologic problem somehow. It's a personal weakness. And that CFS, when you say that to those people who use the word that way, CFS follows from stress, it sounds like, you know, it's just a characterologic problem, not an underlying biological problem. That I categorically don't think there's any evidence for. But it is true that many of my patients, but not all, say two things. They say, at the time I came down with CFS, most of them at the came up, time I came down with some sort of infection, uh, I was under an unusual amount of stress in my life. It may have been stress at work, stress at home. Um, and many people, but not all, with CFS say that if they are placed in stressful situations, if a parent dies and there's a lot of work that has to be done around that death, and just a lot of family strains that come to the surface when everyone reconvenes because someone has passed away, that those sorts of stressful life events are as associated with making them feel worse. So I think being under stress may make a body vulnerable to chronic fatigue syndrome and many other illnesses, um, and it may make the chronic fatigue syndrome temporarily worse. But I don't think that stress and characterologic weakness are the cause of CFS, and I've shown you a lot of evidence that would, that of things that are wrong in CFS that are not explained by stress. Um, a rheumatologist in the audience, um, I think appropriately asks me to, to say again, to underline what I think I said, which is that while in the study of rituximab that was 30 patients, there were no serious adverse events, which is good. I also said that you never conclude that a treatment has no serious adverse effect on the basis of 30 people because the 31st person may suffer. Um, and in fact, rituximab is used in oncola, in cancer, certain kinds of cancers and rheumatologic illnesses. And we know that it can have serious adverse effects. That's why uh, I don't think it's wise for me or other practicing physicians uh, 
to use rituximab in CFS patients until the evidence through randomized trials is a lot stronger. Uh, and even then, we, you would have to weigh the risk of the treatment against the benefit. There's someone who has written temporal lobe seizures. Um, but, so that's not a question, but let me talk about it because I think it's a very interesting thing. There are many different kinds of seizures. Um, one kind are called temporal lobe seizures. When you think of a seizure, you think of people who suddenly become very stiff and call out and then collapse and start shaking and lose consciousness. That's one kind of seizure. There's another kind of seizure that's been described probably for 70 or 80 years called temporal lobe seizures in which people suddenly don't lose consciousness, don't start shaking all over. They just start behaving in very strange ways. They may go around the, the house and pull pillows off the sofa and pull out the drawers and the dresser and do things that don't make a lot of sense and then a few minutes later they're back to themselves. They also don't communicate with others around them much at all during that window of time. When and if you put brainwave measures on their, or instruments on their head, you can see that during those spells, when they haven't lost consciousness but they behave very strangely, you see seizure activity in their brain waves in the part of the brain called the temporal lobes. Uh, that, there are other interesting things about temporal lobe seizures. Uh, people tend to talk an awful lot and write an awful lot. And they will write letters to friends that are 10, 20, 30 pages of handwritten letters. Um, all sort of strange behavior explained or associated with this electroencephalographic brainwave picture. Why does that have anything to do with CFS? Because CFS patients don't have these kinds of sudden bizarre behavioral episodes. No, but some CFS patients describe spells when they or their family or friends say, they just seemed out of it for, for five minutes, 10 minutes. Something was not right. They weren't going around the house doing weird things. Now, you hear that as a doctor, as I did for the first time 25 years ago, and you say, I wonder if that person could be having a very subtle kind of temporal lobe seizure. Uh, so we and, uh, and others, I in conjunction with Dr. Frank Duffy, who's an expert uh, in brainwave studies, have looked to see whether there is any abnormalities in the brain waves in the temporal lobes in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. And there surely is. Those lobes produce what are called spike waves and sharp waves, which are the features of seizures, much more often than in healthy individuals. And I talked about this spectral coherence study uh, that was based on brain waves where the abnormalities were dominantly in the temporal lobes. To make it even more interesting, at least to me, there is one infectious agent, human herpes virus 6, that has been linked to chronic fatigue syndrome. We know that it is a virus that infects many parts of the body, including the brain. Um, what has been shown um, by, very provocatively by Dr. Stephen Jacobson, the head of neurovirology at NIH, uh, is that in temporal lobe seizures, particularly certain kinds of so-called mesial temporal lobe seizures, that part of the brain is infected with HHV6, with human herpes virus 6. Uh, the pictures and the studies that he's done are really very dramatic. Uh, and so I think it's entirely possible, although unproven, that one particular infectious agent may make people more vulnerable both to temporal lobe seizures and 
to CFS. And that may be a way the two different illnesses are linked. That's a hypothesis. I'm not saying it's proven. I am saying there's already pretty interesting scientific evidence. Uh, am I aware of any studies treating the mitochondrial abnormality? Um, not large studies that are randomized trials in CFS. There is someone down at Columbia University Medical School who I understand is engaged in or uh, planning such studies, but I don't know any details. But if, if it's going to happen, you'll be able to find it on the web. If I had any advice for those of you living with the disease, what would you recommend? Um, I, that's a tough question. Um, I think my advice would be, what I would say to you is this. Um, I wish I could say I feel your pain because I've experienced the same suffering, but I can't say that. I can say that I've seen an awful lot of people with this illness and I know how, how tough it can be to live the life that you want to live, live with the illness. I have never seen any patient get progressively worse over time. In fact, most patients after the first really terrible 6 to 12 months seem to gradually improve or at least to cope better with the illness and hence function better. But I haven't seen a progressive downhill course. I also advise all of my patients to, and this is tough because you won't always get it right, to pace yourself, to push yourself physically and intellectually and emotionally, cautiously, carefully, but if you keep pushing as opposed to becoming, feeling defeated by it, I think you actually, and there are even some studies that show it, you actually will progressively feel better and function better. Um, but that's my best advice. Uh, the other advice is to stay tuned uh, for what's happening in the world of research because it is only there that definitive answers are going to come. And as I said, they haven't come yet. That is painfully obvious to all of us. But on the other hand, looking at it, dispassionately as a scientist, we know so much more today about this illness and so many great scientists who didn't know or care about this illness 20 years ago are now really interested that I'm optimistic that fundamental answers uh, will come. How can we get more doctors um, to know about this illness? Well, as I say, it, sure has changed a lot since 1989 when I first came here. I think every doctor I know has heard about the illness. Uh, how do you make doctors more knowledgeable about it? That's really tough. First of all, the experts don't have the fundamental answers. We don't have the diagnostic test or the proven treatment. So if the experts don't have it, practicing docs are not, have got nothing yet to learn. But those answers are coming, and they will learn. Um, as a practicing doctor, I have sympathy for the average doctor who has no special interest in chronic fatigue syndrome because the fact of the matter is the amount of medical information for every doctor about every disease is going up and up and up and keeping up with anything keeping up with diabetes, keeping up with colon cancer, keeping up with heart attacks uh, is nearly impossible for any practicing doctor. Uh, 1989, there were something like 13,000 journals publishing medical research. Today, it's double that. There have been 8,000 new journals publishing tens of thousands of articles just in the last five years. Um, it's very tough for doctors to learn even about the most established diseases. There's, and I don't have an answer for that beyond um, 
publications like the one that I founded with the Mass Medical Society, New England Journal of Medicine called Journal Watch, that summarizes what those of us involved think are the most important research for practicing docs from all sorts of journals all over the world because there's no way any individual doctor can do that for himself or herself. Um, so I don't have a good answer. Right now the fact is most doctors have heard of this illness but really don't know much about it and therefore, and some are sympathetic and some are not sympathetic and I don't have any, um, I, I, I don't want to speak ill of such people but the first requirement of any doctor is to take seriously the suffering that any patient who walks in his or her door brings to them and not to dismiss it. And whenever that happens, and unfortunately it does happen with CFS patients, I think that doctor has not served the central function that any doctor has to serve with any patient. The name of the researcher uh, involved in enteroviral infection research. His name is Dr. John Chia, C-H-I-A. He is based in Southern California, uh, has an affiliation, I believe, with UCLA School of Medicine, R runs a private laboratory, and, um, and I don't know, as I said, if he has underway any particular studies. That's how you find him. So that's the group of questions. Um, if my answers to those questions have provoked one or two more burning questions. I'd be happy to stay to answer those. I guess not. Uh, thank you very much. I greatly enjoyed this and I hope that was helpful. really a wonderful afternoon, packed full of information and making complicated, complex things much clearer. So that's what we know you for and thank you so much.